Okay. We're going to start now, and surely people, more people will join, but that we don't lose so much time, we start. Welcome to Idle World, a talk with Lawrence Lack. Interlaced with conspiracy theories and speculative fiction, Lawrence Lack's CGI films, installations, and open world games explore the geopolitical impact of automation and simulation. His universe is populated with dreamers intelligent satellites, freedom fighters, fading superstars, all searching for autonomy in a future dominated by data. His latest projects revolve around the idea and concept of xenofuturism, which draws on the parallels between Chinese industrialization and portrayal of artificial intelligence. Lawrence is an artist, filmmaker and musician based in London whose works have been exhibited widely in museums and art spaces. He studied at the University of Cambridge, the Architectural Association in London and Cooper Union in New York. So we're going to have this one hour talk or we can extend it a little bit longer and it will precede the German premiere of his new feature length film Idol as part of the screening and performance event Future Worlds of Entanglement tonight at 8 p.m. here at the Große Haus of Volksbühne. So we're gonna go um, along our conversation. Lawrence is gonna show images and um, film excerpts from his work. And of course, we're gonna also open to you for questions and, and comments. And I will want to already take the... Um, or occasion, before I forget at the end, to thank a few people, also because that will be now not only the end of the festival tonight, but also the end of the film program of the festival. So I want to uh, um, thank Ricarda Bross, who was the project, or is the project manager of the film program of Transmediale 2020, Christian Kleinwächter, project, who um, taking care of the um, projections, um, Lane Patterson to also organize that event here, Lukas Kleiner, the stage manager um, of this event now, and Gregor and Jonathan from Volksbühne who do sound and, um, and light and everything. So, welcome Lawrence and thanks for your interest and attention. But I have a... Thank you. I would start with a question to open up. Um, I recently read an article about the newly built city um, Shongdo in South Korea, which above all is a demo and test laboratory for the smart high-tech city of the future. An optimized environment to match corporate interests and computerized user lifestyles. What's for real in South Korea really reminded me of your invention of Farsight Corporation, which emerged from a fictional startup in your film Geomancer from 2017 and also plays a decisive role in Idol. So I would be curious for you, um, for you to start also with Farsight and how that is really, a, a, let's say, a very important feature in your work and in the universe I'd already described. Um, yeah, first of all, yeah, thanks for coming. I'm just going to dive into the different layers that it, it integrates, basically. So I've always been interested in this idea, I mean, basically the, the boundary between the virtual and the real, basically. And one of, one of the things that really annoys, annoyed me in kind of, I guess, kind of um, a lot of discourse, especially in architecture, let's say, was the, the idea that essentially the virtual was somehow lesser than the real. Um, and also the kind of implicit fundamentalism that this idea of kind of um, the physical embodiment or the kind of genuine nature or authenticity of various things um, uh, should be. It's as if like there's something implicitly lesser in simulating that one person is something else or that uh, a product is copying something else essentially. So. Um, uh, Geomancer, which is basically this kind of buildings roman or like coming of age story about an AI who wants to be an artist, is set in Singapore in 2065. And in this, basically, Farsight is the analog for whatever kind of like Google evil, you know, um, Cyberdyne systems kind of corporation that creates this AI. But 
one of the things I'm, I'm always very wary of is being uh, very basically acknowledging the networks essentially that I am very much part of or that I was born into. You know, so for example, just biographically, it says I'm born in Frankfurt, which I was. Um, and so on paper, people can assume that essentially this interest in, let's say, Sinofuturism, whatever, comes from uh, a kind of academic interest instead of like a kind of personal immersion in it. Um, my, my story in a sense, I'm always interested in this idea of the, you know, like origin myths and things like that, or how to marry like technology with the beginning somehow. So essentially like I started thinking for myself, where does my story begin? So one version of events is that it starts in 1926 in Berlin when the kind of, um, the aviation company that would later become Lufthansa was founded and of course it went through many different things under the Third Reich and then after after the end of the Second World War and so the reason I was born in Frankfurt was that my parents who are Malaysian Chinese and moved to Singapore because of political and economic reasons basically in the 70s worked for Singapore Airlines and then they went to um, move to Frankfurt which is um, I mean where I was born so I mean essentially I'm not just a product of a network, but I'm a product of this in, uh, entanglement, really, between, you know, mega carbon polluting industry number one, um, and, and this kind of search or desire for a better life in the midst of this kind of competitive landscape, you know, let's say between Lufthansa and kind of Asian carriers for kind of essentially the um, commercialization of the aviation industry from you know military to uh, commercial passengers so I'm always interested in th like thinking not just um, you know fictionally as an artist but also myself as a product of the corporation basically so Farsight is a way for me to kind of um, actually empathize with both narratives not just as me wanting to be an artist but also thinking like how does you know, a kind of startup founder think, even though, you know, there's like one employee and it's got no funding, you know, somehow this idea of being able to empathize, not just with a non-human AI, but also, you know, the, the kind of figure who's generally seen as like, you know, the enemy of kind of independence and autonomy versus my own interest in, you know, this idea of like self-actualization. So Farsight basically, it's, uh, you know, it started essentially as um, this is a this is a launch ad. Uh, you can sign up for nothing. Um, basically, so I started thinking, what if in 2065, if I were to fulfill the fictional Lawrence, timeline? One, just of, can you identify sorry. what's really about the 2065? Where does that come from? So 2065 is the hundredth anniversary of the founding of Singapore, basically. So I was trying to draw parallels between essentially this like startup culture or essentially like Singapore as a nation state, which was kind of conceived as a technocratic startup, essentially, um, after its kind of separation from Malaya, after Malaya was separated from um, British Empire in 1957. So I'm trying to draw these parallels between, I guess, the search for independence or growth for like a startup nation state and kind of uh, independent conscious mind, which was this um, AI who wants to be an artist, basically. So that's the significance of 2065. But the other thing I thought in terms of a hyperstitional narrative was what if actually having written this film where, you know, there's this kind of like evil corporation and stuff, what if I actually, f my job essentially for the next 47 years, I might change my mind, is to actually fulfill this, um, fulfill this fictional timeline. And so, Every, more or less every project I've done since then has been kind of like in the science fiction world building way, kind of choreographed to fulfill that timeline. So it's like, if 2065, that's when Geomancer is, and then the week after that is when Idol is set, the film that's showing later. Back in 2018 is when Farsight was started uh, as the company, essentially. And the reason for, uh, for this, and you know, Farsight's all very you know, exciting and it's celebrating this um, post-work automated future, which is gonna be very useful, I'm sure, with um, you know, current technological developments. Um, that was the idea of the corporation, obviously advertising, I mean, how advertising works. You, know? you promise the future based on a kind of wish fulfillment of the present. But this, uh, I'll 
um, go back to you in a second, but then this idea of speculation actually continued, uh, actually stemmed from this video essay, Sino Futurism, which we'll talk about more, which I made when writing the script for Geomancer. Um, you mentioned it now several times, and also I in the introduction, the, um, the concept and the notion of the future. And in the Farsight Vision Statement, um, I quote from it, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And with this statement, you're already in the mid of the scene of, um, sign of futurist idea, where um, the future rates the present. It is already there. It's not something in a temporary relationship. It's here and it occupies and it changes the present. And so I'd be curious to hear, or probably everybody more, that you expand on the ideas of scene of futurism and how that also relates, especially where you now create, um, expand yourself as a, as a hybrid, but with lots of also biological links, so to say, to China and to Southeast Asia in the larger. Um, so as I said earlier, I made Sino Futurism when I was um, actually looking a, a lot about deep learning research, a lot about you know kind of this AlphaGo match and how that was represented, as well as kind of contemporary fears and anxieties around East Asia, which I mean, in a different sense, we see now not just with Huawei and 5G, but with coronavirus and all these kind of things, you know. Very much this like specter of the other is very much present and very much um, just as dangerous as before, if not more so. So um, basically, the other thing I want to clarify is that this, uh, I mean, this is just my particular personal interpretation of what Sinofuturism is. What I hadn't anticipated at the time is, of course, because I guess, let's say, um, post-colonial space or this kind of political manifesto space is a very, uh, how shall we say, territorial area. Um, I, it wasn't that I was trying to like provoke a, a kind of response to this idea of, you know, what's it called, like, you know, techno-orientalism or anything like this. It was more to feed in actually a very personal narrative of essentially my experience of the future as it was growing up in Southeast Asia, like um, basically, you know, Hong Kong and Singapore after Frankfurt, and the way in which the future can be promised, essentially. So I'm just going to uh, play the first four minutes of Sino Futurism and then kind of talk about the ways I intended it and maybe the ways it's kind of interpreted or misinterpreted. Sino Futurism. Sino-futurism is an invisible movement, a specter already embedded into a trillion industrial products, a billion individuals, and a million veiled narratives. It is a movement, not based on individuals, but on multiple overlapping flows, flows of populations, of products, and of processes. Because Sino-Futurism has arisen without conscious intention or authorship, it is often mistaken for contemporary China. But it is not. It is a science fiction that already exists. This video essay is a retroactive manifesto for Sino-Futurism, combining historical fantasy, documentary melodrama, and social realism with Chinese cosmologies. China only recently became the factory of the world. This is only the latest incarnation of the Chinese work ethic. It is a work ethic based on farm labor and large families, in an agrarian society prone to natural disasters, within a Confucian belief system that values hard work as the only insurance against a turbulent world. Multiple stereotypes of this eastern other are everywhere. Whether Chinese Olympic athletes are branded as robots, or Chinese students or tourists are likened to swarms, or Shenzhen factory workers are criticized for flooding the marketplace, the subtext is the same. It is the dehumanization of the individual into a nameless, faceless mass. On the other hand is the Orientalist aesthetic narrative, where China is the exotic other, eternally unknowable, mysterious, powerless yet seductive. But 
rather than resisting cultural cliches, Sinofuturism embraces seven key stereotypes associated with China. These are its guiding principles, computing, copying, gaming, studying, addiction, labor, and gambling. At a material level, it is already everywhere, in architecture, in the products and technologies that we use every day. However, I propose something more radical. I propose that Sinofuturism is in fact a form of artificial intelligence, a massively distributed neural network, focused on copying rather than originality, addicted to learning of massive amounts of raw data rather than philosophical critique or morality, with the post-human capacity for work, and an unprecedented sense of collective will to power. Rat so, um, just briefly speaking, that a lot of those kind of stemmed from observations that the ways in which Chinese industrialization and AI and um, automation are being represented were, you know, exactly the same thing. You know, capable of working 24-7 with this kind of like, without any moral purpose, but with this, you know, hu huge capacity for work and so on. I kind of thought that AI would be this, you know, the ideal like avatar for, you know, sign of futurism essentially. But going back to this hyperstitional narrative, so having created the video essay while making Geomancer, because Geomancer is set in 2065, um, the AIs in Geomancer would have seen Sinofuturism basically and use that as their kind of manifesto for practice basically. So, you know, copying rather than morality, kind of copying rather than originality, uh, massive amounts of learning and that would be essentially their manifesto as opposed to a kind of humanist vision of individual genius or kind of originality basically. Um, and so this, yeah, this video essay was wrapped in with the kind of fiction that I was making in, in Geomancer basically and kind of refracted on it in different ways, yeah. But the video essay is um, um, earlier than Geomancer, no? You did in 2016 and 17, then followed Geomancer. Um, as you mentioned now, um, AI is an avatar in sign of futurism, but there's another point to it, um, because the AI you or Geomancer in persona is an AI with a great aspiration, and the aspiration is to become an artist. So in a way to create, and that is, we can frame that or rephrase that as a sort of longing for, or for the concept or idea or the question around an automated creativity. And so I'm really now, um, I don't know whether you've been in the exchange panel um, number five now, it was a lot about machine learning processes and this whole discussion, okay, is that for let's say new, it may be intelligence of wrong term anyways, because this is about process of computation that had the human not as a measure. And um, so where is that difference? And um, is that getting smaller or is it, con does it continue to be significant because machines just work so different than humans and will ever do? So maybe some of your reflections on that, on, um, and in order to hear about this construct of automated creativity and your character that wants to become an artist, also it's an artificial intelligence. Sure, I mean, I think the, the question of, I mean, obviously what constitutes intelligence or consciousness and, you know, draws in so many different things from the kind of like, let's say, a practical machine um, applied AI perspective to the kind of philosophy of mind one. I mean, personally, as, as an artist, I'm always, like I said before, interested in the fact that, I guess, the simulation of understanding is, the perfect simulation of understanding or consciousness is essentially what would constitute consciousness. And what I mean by that is, so much of, um, I mean, film, for example, right? You know, there's a difference between, I mean, was it in kind of, kind of poetic styles, the, the idea of like mimesis versus diegesis, right? There's a like narration or the simulation of the action that's happening. And 
every different art form to do with, I mean, especially to do with film or video games or theater or literature for that matter, is really about the tension between those two things. I just want to play a short clip here of um, an early, quite early project called Dans Dalson Mon Amour, which is essentially a kind of refiguring of Hiroshima Mon Amour into the East London area of Dalston. And what was interesting about about this when I was kind of reading about, you know, essentially the making of this um, Alain René film is that the um, Japanese actor, I use this example a lot, the Japanese actor delivering their lines didn't speak French. They learned the sounds of French to deliver it in this like believable acting performance with the French actress, but he didn't understand what he was saying. It's across lip sync. Huh? Yeah, it's... He, he, it's not even lip sync. He's d delivering the lines, kind of like, um, you know, uh, like cover bands in the Philippines sing Beatles songs, but they don't know the li what the lyrics mean. So, so in this sense, it's like you know the simulation of language for the viewer, for the audience, which is, you know, us, would constitute, um, at least to me, like um, mimesis or this kind of art, uh, aesthetic understanding. Which brings me back to, of course, um, you know, Alan Turing's, what became called the Turing test, right? Where it's, he, at least he considered the point in which intelligence could be said to exist is when it would be indistinguishable for a kind of third party observer of two, um, think, uh, two consciousnesses playing the Turing test, when the third party, of, sorry, when the person asking the questions or the person observing the questions being asked could no longer distinguish whether the answers were by a consciousness or not. So what I'm trying to say is what is so fascinating to me is that it's always, it's always the audience really that, that essentially judges whether intelligence or consciousness or non-human rights or ethical issues can be said to exist you know it's not just existing in this um i guess laboratory condition of the ai being created and the the test subject and the kind of scientist or programmer testing the subject it is judged by a kind of third party and so this um triangulation between the audience the um and different sets, uh, sorry, the audience, the person being tested, the thing being tested, and the tester, to me at least, is what constitutes my idea of what, how consciousness might arise, basically. And I guess that suits my questions as well, because it kind of puts art as a kind of crucial aspect in, in this framework, basically. I just want to play this bit, because I like it. I think another point I just want to make as well is that I, I, I guess just in terms of um, sensibility, I'm always interested in the not just like euphoria, dysphoria, tension, but also you know the the kind of the future utopia versus the kind of nostalgia, ruined nostalgia, basically that that exists within that. Yeah. So it's always there at the same time, or like an utopian aspect and the dystopian. Exactly, and and you know especially with I don't know things like. I guess electronic music, the combination of like sad lyrics, happy melody, or like sad melody, happy lyrics. It's kind of that tension, I guess, that, I mean, I'm, I'm just drawn to this idea where you're not exactly sure what emotional state is meant to be created, basically. It's kind of push and pull. Just as a little um, diversion, um, is you, the artist, um, creating the animated world, and you are also the musician. Can you give a little insight into your practice? I mean, it's all really done by yourself. Um, I think now with Idol, you really reached a 
different level of production means and of um, production effort. Maybe a little side note on that, on how you actually um, work in the studio. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, when I was studying architecture, I always had this, I guess, fantasy that, you know, like, if you could bring this like spatial practice of um, architecture basically or set design with a kind of different kind of time-based medium practice of you know music and film together or narrative they would both kind of feed into each other essentially and so I guess I started really doing much more like you know online music electronic music self-distributed through blogs and stuff about 11 years ago and of course back then as anyone involved in you know as a fan or as a producer knows the um the constellation of networks was very different right so it was like myspace as opposed to soundcloud like kind of perpetual streaming hadn't started and so for me i was so excited by the fact that you know you could distribute these um i mean diy material for free and i guess up to about two years uh, uh, until about I made Geo the, the point in which I made Geomancer, I was kind of doing more or less most things myself, um, or at least thinking like a landscape painter, like which elements of the world I want to abstract, which ones I kind of want to twist and, you know, cast into the future or something. Um, but then I kind of realized, I mean, you know, it's the, uh, I guess, this DIY mentality, which is really great at a certain point, is its own glass ceiling because I started asking myself why was it that you know so many amazing artists they're only making short films essentially kind of like you know amazing writers or authors who are always writing short stories or articles and I, I kind of thought that was I mean it's uh, it's an economic thing because of the attention economy wants more and more kind of atomized products you know 300 word article one three minute remix, you know, one short video, one Instagram clip, basically. And so I kind of consciously made a decision with, I guess, Sign of Futurism, Geomancer, and now Idol to kind of challenge myself in this, um, yeah, just to make kind of longer form things, you know, not really because it's the next kind of economic step up, but just because I didn't, um, I didn't know actually how complex it is to weave together so many different narratives with kind of different time scales you know not just now or the future and not just responding to like uh, present day politics but thinking how present day politics might be reflected upon in the future as well so um these processes of time-based media where you know music film and visual art kind of all helped to um build this different rhythm of creating things i guess um, since we're gonna see Idol in one hour um, or more because there will be first, first a performance by um, La Turbo Avedon and um, Miriam Bleu before we see the film so it's our great double bill high, um, highlight event tonight here Transmediale um, and to move over to, to Idol and its kind of uh, narrative um, context, I find really interesting that you have there, on the one hand, you have the in this, um, entertainment industry as one aspect, and the other is your eSports Olympics 2065. And I find that very well chosen in the context of what the Olympic Games meant to China and will mean again. I just recall in 2008 we had the Beijing Summer Games and coming up um, now the, the Winter Games, right? And um, so that's also maybe a decisive um, in regard of that, how xenofuturism, as you said, it has these stereotypes and cliches which are resem I mean, which it embraces, rather creating resilience against it, are not only the ones that projected mainly from the West onto China, but also the ones that are self-created. And in that, let's say, dialogue or this emphasis um, on the both things. It's like limitless modernization and going back to a whole history of cultural heritage. And I think that's also probably something that informed a lot, the sort of marketing and the decisive moment of the Olympic game and how you pick up on that now in Idol. So maybe you can expand on, on this, what you, um, what you built into the narrative which um, makes so much sense against your discourse um, dealing with... Um, well, um 
China and its modernization sure. project? Um, so just a brief aside, after, so relating to music, sometimes I make the soundtrack and then a film and then a video game and sometimes it's like an open world video game and then a film comes out of it. So um, I kind of wanted to reframe Geomancer the next year after that actually as a video game. So I made this open world video game called 2065, published by Farsight. Um, but, you know, this is, I mean, I'm just going to play this on silent and this was um, basically it's installed as kind of like an open world video game just as a game where kind of the seeds of this kind of Sino Futurist universe are basically like hinted at but not explicitly described. Um, but to also talk about the kind of chaos, this, this kid here is my favorite. He's charging his, charging his phone with the like controller port instead of playing the game. And I, <laughs> I just found it so interesting i guess this i guess this clash of interaction or like spectator spectatorship versus the audience basically um so you know here i have like this kind of um you know framed within this map of singapore and this like 300 dpi video rendering of of you know p printed backdrop the the fact that maybe the future doesn't care so much you know um and somehow the way that like the art or like ideology might be kind of expressed would be through different means basically anyway so this these experiences of like you know not theorizing about gaming but actually thinking about the way in which it's really embedded into discourse about ai kind of informed what i was um thinking about idol so i was just you know for this i kind of was looking at the original like I think storyboards, which I generally don't do for Idol. So the original title was called Call of Beauty, which is, you know, like a kind of play on Call of Duty. But this exists within the uh, the, the film itself as the esports game that they're playing in the film. And I came across uh, this amazing quote by, I mean, Alan Turing. We do not wish to punish the machine for its inability to shine in beauty competitions, nor to punish the human for losing in a race against an aeroplane. The conditions of our game make these disabilities irrelevant. So this, again, was in his uh, article for um, called Computing Machinery and Intelligence. I mean, it's, you know, the, like the seminal AI paper, basically. But, I mean, it's... It's just amazing to me how much, you know, not just this like consciousness or language, but the game is fundamental to our conception of AI and not just the Olympics and, you know, people who, theor you know, sports theorists basically theorize that, of course, sports is, you know, the sublimation of um, our warlike violent instincts or animal nature into, you know, into a structured competition of nation states at war with, in with, with each other. Um, but I guess for me, like esports was a way to wrap in uh, this, you know, this incredibly wide um, spectrum of events, basically, and histories as well, into something that functions as entertainment, really, you know, because that's how esports is with, you know, clans and leagues and fans and, and all the spectacle around it. Um, I think the other thing I just want to say about idol as well is that it's not just about the esports or olympic competition it's also about all of the other arts that are integrated into sports so basically diva's final performance is you know it's like the halftime super bowl olympics basically you know and that is essentially you know the, as far as i remember the most widely seen event in real time on earth um and for anyone who hasn't seen Prince's super, halftime Super Bowl performance, it's, I mean, it's amazing, basically, because it's like torrential rain, and he's singing Purple Rain, and it kind of seems, in a really weird way, that this kind of accident of nature, this kind of human star, and this kind of machine of art slash entertainment slash competition all coincide at that particular moment. You know, the random... Piece of the art. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing, basically. Um, but, I mean, as, as, you know, has been said in the discussion, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, um, uh, you know, 
destruction, apocalypse, the idea of like the technological sublime, what does that even mean? And I just, you know, I'm interested in art and entertainment as obviously not just a practice which, you know, is earning a living, but also so something where there's these moments that uh, coincide with each other basically between, you know, the super corporate thing and like the joy of watching some people on stage basically. Yeah, there we are in this situation of the entanglement. Yeah, and um, but maybe one another thing you could expand on in terms of idol. What you're gonna experience is that it's how it's organized in its structure, and that also relates a lot to your music practice and how much that idol is also more than a film in that respect. Sure. So um, the um, idol is structured like a 13-track album, basically, and there's different kind of temporalities that happen in it. Obviously, there's like the real time of a film with kind of, you know, events start here and end here with some flashbacks in between. But because I'm playing with different, I guess, um, visual cultures, there's like cinematic visual culture, there's um, uh, music video culture, there's also video games culture. So it's kind of deliberately ambiguous, really, like whether um, it's essentially a very long promotional video for this new album or whether it's you know actually a, a fictional film with a soundtrack in it and there's also different ways of kind of breaking up the narrative um, and kind of composing it because I was looking also as this kind of long form work at you know just kind of conventional ways of doing a soundtrack or you know theater or film scoring which is you know leitmotif right so every character has um, a theme which kind of starts and then develops and then kind of reaches some kind of conclusion. And of course, that usually in a theater, you know, it's like, whatever, the Volcarize have their theme and it, com it comes at different points. But um, with this, it, because it's literally about Diva writing her album, and so the different songs uh, exist in different, uh, I guess, versions of the songs themselves in, uh, throughout the sequence of the film. And it's also meant to be I mean, not make complete sense in a way until like there's various conspiracies embedded within it as to like what some uh, motivations are. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that I was just interested in the ult what I saw as like the ultimate paradox of art making. I guess I mean maybe not the ultimate one, um, which is basically death is good for business, right? Like I mean. Prince, for example, right? Any star who dies, there's a finality to that, uh, the idea of like cultural production. So of course they might be resurrected as reissues or holograms or whatever, but the simple fact that death is good for sales is incredibly perverse, basically. Um, and of course it's, you know, in terms of like, let's say revolutionaries or activists, you know, death makes that person a martyr. And of course in, um, but I was thinking it, with Idol is like, could death make the star a superstar, basically? And that's uh, kind of the, I mean, real sadness or kind of paradoxical, I guess, Faustian pact, really, you know, with this idea of fame in this algorithmic data-driven system of the future, I guess. I wonder, I mean, we didn't talk about that, but maybe it's, a, would you have the trailer um, just there or... Yeah, I mean, because we had said we wouldn't show an excerpt, but maybe it makes sense now. And then we could also open up to. Yeah, that's great. Comment. Okay. Um, but if that's too much, no, we don't do that. No, I think I've got a trailer somewhere. Does it make sense, you think? Yes. Yeah. Yes? Trailer? Okay. I will have to find. Wait one sec. Um, in this world of videos, maybe I don't have the trailer. Oh, yes, I do. Diva，有一天他们需要你。接着，他们会删除你。还有些时间完成这首歌。难道你不想永远活着吗？用锤不朽，我不想。这不是困扰我的问题。我们的世界已经由外转向里。机器学习
影响者的影响。四十年代的时候 ，Temple 真的很活跃。我每晚都去，我在那儿遇到了所有的明星、制片人和设计师，这是我全部的生命。Thanks. Ah,、uh, there. Yeah. <laughs> Lucas, we have a microphone, right, floating? Yeah. Any questions, remarks from your side? Yes, please. There's a microphone coming. Hi.、Um, yes, it's on. I have a question regarding to、um, the human figure,、uh, consciousness, and also what it essentially means, maybe for idol, for AI, but also for you as an artist, what it means to be human. <laughs> That's it. That was <laughs>、yeah. the question.、Uh, I don't know.、Um, no, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, it comes up quite a lot because in my earlier work, it was basically like. I mean, first-person perspective, right? Rather than like having any human figures in the world itself, and so people quite often would ask. I mean, before I had human figures, like, oh, it's so sad. It's like there's no one around. Which number one, it's much easier to render, but also <laughs> number two, number two, I was always interested in this. I mean, as kind of any.、Uh, You know, painting fans would know like this idea of, I mean, like was it Caspar David Friedrich, Rukin figure kind of thing, like the、um, the figure with the back turned towards you. And what I thought was interesting, I mean, this is one of his paintings actually, that has no figures within it, but within that, essentially, you know, the figure, the human figure. Would be, you know, let's say yourself or the viewer's self at different stages of your life. You know, very often there's like kind of grandparents, parents, and the child. Not as not to represent this like happy family, but to you know say like past, present, and future.、Um, and what I would kind of respond in my works, which had no human figure in it, is that actually like. It's full of humans. It's full of humanity because you know there's voices, there's music, there's the there's、um, the building of the world or the processes in it, right? It's like the lights are on, but there's no one around. So I kind of did a few tests with actual, like let's say, human avatars populating this world. And what I think as well is, particularly when you're having a video game aesthetic, the moment you have a, let's say, intelligent simulating life form in it, whether it's like an animal or a robot or another avatar, basically, you. As a viewer, you switch from a mode of thinking as a kind of,、um, let's say, like fourth wall kind of audience, right? You're witnessing stuff that happens, or the first person one, and immediately, and I think this is like a kind of neurophysiological thing. You think, how can I interact with this being? Are they like a friend? Are they a threat? Do I have to engage with them in some way? And so, I mean, until Idol, basically, I kind of wanted to avoid having. Essentially, any kind of animate object. I mean, not just a human figure there. So that actually, the main dialogue I was interested in is like you as the viewer, or me as the viewer, or player, and like this kind of blank canvas architecture. You know, because I think I was really conditioned studying architecture with this. You know, like、um, you know, let's say,、uh, I guess. Walter Benjamin kind of idea that you know, like 
the city is reflecting your mental state as you're exploring the land, and that's kind of, I guess, the psychology um, I was more interested in at the time. Thank you so much for sharing this uh, slice of all your different work. I have a question, and I might have gotten this wrong, but um, it seems like I'm fascinated by the way you're working with this longer timeline and the way you're talking about uh, Geomancer in 2065, uh, and then sort of outlining these inner causalities between the different projects and how sort of some character would have experienced the consequences of another project and also locating yourself in this moment of time and sort of doing projects that might point forward towards that future that you're showing us. It sounds a bit like sort of backcasting from a far away future and then sort of moving backwards and looking at all the steps that we need or we could take towards that particular future. I'm just uh, curious if you can talk a bit more about how you populate that timeline with your work and how you locate yourself at this given moment, for example right now <laughs> um i i mean i don't mm, it's kind of like i i mean basically i'm just not really sure where it's leading essentially i mean i think part of the thing was you know 2065 is conveniently within hopefully my lifespan so at some at some point i might you know, see whether that's realized or not. But, you know, going back to this idea of, um, I guess, architecture as well, like, you know, unrealized, it's kind of very perverse, basically, because most, I guess, like, conceptual, imaginary discourse with, you know, architecture and world building exists through the realm of unrealized projects, right? This, you know, plan to transform London or Berlin or Beijing. Um, versus like what what the reality is i guess so i feel what's interesting for me is okay so for example sign of futurism august 2016 um there's so many things that i obviously didn't account for right um i didn't account for i mean from uh you know i was kind of focused on let's say like post-colonial dynamics there's no like kind of biopolitics or gender politics or like 5g networks or kind of bike sharing or you know any of these things that have emerged so quickly. Um, so I think with the, th with the projects that are set in the near future, it's interesting because, you know, I can reflect on what I didn't account for and kind of like um, basically, um, how should I say, evaluate my own ignorance in the past. Um, and I think things that are in the more distant future, I mean, of course, I would also have to say that, you know, AI is both about AI and it's also AI as a kind of um, allegory for any, you know, let's say marginalized, subjugated, othered group as well. So it's, you know, it's definitely operating on that in that sense as well. Um, but yeah, it's it's also a response to uh, just the very narrow representations of diversity, let's say, uh, that that exist, un unfortunately. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, this was one of the most elaborate artist talks I've ever heard, really. <laughs> and I was super intrigued uh, by, by, that you, by the fact that you brought up the Turing quote. And I was just going to mention that I've, I've looked into it a bit as well, and uh, especially like Elizabeth uh, Wilson's uh, treating of artificial intelligence in Turing. Um, and the fact that he was trying to be also a man that was often interpreted as the 50s version of being human. But then he was, of course, also homosexual, and uh, it was not his desire to be a 50s man, but he was trying to be that man that was expected in order to stand in front of a court uh, and be, being able to say, yeah, I'm a real man, right? And I was wondering, uh, in that regard, if, you're also, if your work is also a kind of uh, form of distancing yourself from that imagined future that you're putting out there? Uh, no, I mean, briefly... I, th I think I was never particularly interested in um, identity politics, basically, or like, who am I? You know, like I said at the beginning, that it's very interesting to me, like, how far back does any individual, tra uh, you know, anyone really, like, trace their origin story or their origin myth? And all I can say is that the history, you know, art history, film history, every kind of cultural history is littered with a huge amount of... Um, 
self-mythologizing, essentially. And so in all of these projects, I'm also, I mean, and it's a classic kind of fiction writer's device, you know, you're trying to imagine yourself as someone or something else, right? Whether that's, you know, this kind of poetic idea of, um, um, you know, uh, personifying the landscape, you know, this like romantic idea, or whether it's a kind of idea of like, I want to think that I am, you know, this AI with a female voice, you know, it's like alternate versions of myself. But in all of these, I kind of use, I kind of, um, how should I say, I generally take different starting points, you know, which might be like literature and kind of put them in a different context, because my overarching thought is that it's not so much that, I mean, it's essentially that, you know, the environment and history shape identity as opposed to the other way around. So my question in all these films, which are very journey-based, you know, kind of like first-person open world stuff, is like, I guess, who, where you are determines who you are as opposed to the, uh, to the other way around. And I imagine that for Turing's case, like when he was and where he was, let's say, you know, British society, 1950s, would, um, was kind of made him with, you know, sad consequences kind of like um, uh, simulate, I mean, ironically, I guess, simulate like a different version of himself as well. Um, but yeah, I think the history of, uh, I think the history of technology and also of origin myths is kind of littered with these tragedies, basically. Um, and so I'm always trying to like, um, I guess, draw from them, you know, th like I said earlier, this happy, sad thing, you know, oh, birth of computing. Oh, suicide. Um, th sadly, they always seem to come hand in hand, depending on how the narrative is written, I think. Hi, uh, thank you so much uh, for this. I've been a big fan of your work, and actually Sinofuturism was the first film that I saw a little over a, a year ago, and um, I found myself um, fe feeling very freed of politics in a way around AI. It's something that I study and, and feel like I must be very political about, and I am in many ways. Um, but whenever I would uh, talk about AI politics, as I do as an, India, as an Indian living and working in, in Germany, in, in Europe, um, when I would speak to people in, in India about it, people who work on tech and you know, sort of think about tech politics, there's a sort of uh, very flat response. AI is not AI. It's, it's just, I don't know, it's, uh, it's mobile phones. There's, and I, there was something very liberating for me in watching Sinofuturism because I felt kind of like, uh, this is about AI, but it's also not about AI. There was a lot of sort of cultural resonances. And uh, the question I'm coming to is, um, have you shown any of your work in places like Singapore, in Malaysia, in, in Hong Kong, in China, and what, what is the response to it? Because it's a question I'm constantly asked or having to research about like AI in India. And um, it's, it's, it's very, very culturally specific and material in, in what it is here. And I, I wonder if you could just kind of talk about some of that. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I've shown quite, I mean, in, quite a lot in Singapore, Hong Kong, and, and mainland China, and other parts of East Asia as well. Um, it's very interesting as well, because as m most of us will probably know, a lot of post-colonial discourse is essentially uh, generated through um, a kind of diasporic intellectual community, like me, basically. Um, as a kind of first stage of, um, I guess, infiltration or adding different examples into the pool which is known as, let's say, cultural discourse. The reason I made Sinofuturism was essentially the fact that I was surprised that it didn't exist, right? And, like, why didn't it exist? It has a lot to do, in general, with the kind of um, uh, cultural position of how, um, um, you know, who, uh, essentially who produces knowledge, who interprets the knowledge, and who... Gener and, and who um, consumes the knowledge as well, which is very different, you know, every five or ten years, you know. Um, I think what's really interesting with kind of AI discourse, and I was responding to a question about this in Rotterdam last week, was that unlike other forms of industrial knowledge, like AI discourse is very much centered around um, uh, basically hotspots of intellectual production, right? Whether that's kind of like... Um, Hyderabad, India, or kind of Beijing in China, or London, or Toronto, or like West Coast America. And I think it, it will take 
a long, not, I, would t I think it will take years for this kind of ideo ideology to trickle down into, I guess, people's consciousness. But of course, exactly, like, it's, <sighs> Sinofuturism was made because I was surprised it did not exist. And yet when I show it in China, or when it gets, you know, banned from some show, I'm, it, it kind of reminds me that the audience is unknown, essentially. I mean, people like you, for example. Um, and not just in this spatio-temporal way. It's not just that my audience is limited to a certain kind of cultural spectrum in, in the world, but also it's limited through time. You know, I cannot imagine when future AIs or future super intelligent Vimeo algorithms are going to, you know, watch this stuff, but I can at least think about the kind of stories or narratives that might be interesting to counteract, you know, uh, narratives where there's no such thing as, you know, inequality or disparity or kind of problematic relations. So this is, I mean, part of what really inspires me is this idea of um, the unknown audience, basically. I mean, like, we are Alan Turing's unknown audience, for example. He has no idea we're sitting here talking about him. But it's kind of that idea which I find most inspiring, actually. Like, the f that's the future I'm interested in, not just, like, the future as it relates to, like, me and my livelihood in the future. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for showing us your work. Uh, this may be a kind of a dumb question, but I see that um, you uh, used music from Super Metroid, and uh, I would like to ask if you borrow anything else from an ideologically, aesthetically, or uh, from a level design or world building perspective from that kind of game? Thanks. Uh, no, this is very good observation. Um, so Super Metroid, for those who don't know, is like a very old kind of platform game. Um, if I remember correctly, you play like Samus or something, and you're like, you know, you, you just go to planets and kill people who live on those planets. That kind of sounds weird when you talk about it, right? Um, <laughs> hmm. Um, I think... Okay, so Sinofuturism, just to talk about the making of it, was the first thing I'd done, which was just purely from like found footage and you know found soundtracks and 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 so on. Um, but what's interesting about Metroid as well is that whatever the problematic planetary politics, it's got a, a sense of like dread. You know, you're kind of like generally underground, like exploring caves, and you you get quite. Um, how should I say, anxious playing it, essentially. And it was essentially the reason that this anxiety that I wanted to conjure up with um, as the kind of starting point of Sinofuturism, it's more like setting the tone of like, you don't know what's going to happen. And just for, and, and the first um, footage is from, you know, Wong Kar Wai's film 2046. And so it's, I was trying to juxt, you know, and you know, this Wong Kar Wai film is, you know, very like romantic about like future nostalgia and like, you know, romance and so on. But I kind of wanted to bring, yeah, this like, you know, um, kind of like romantic uh, Asian nostalgia basically with this idea of like post-human dread that um, Metroid brings as well. So, I mean, that's just what I was thinking about. But world design is not really from platform games, you know, which are like side-scrolling. It's much f more like I was looking at the level design of early games, like, um, you know, I was watching these interviews by um, John Romero, who's a level designer for Doom and Doom 2, basically, and thinking about how um, th those games, which are 3D games, I mean, pseudo 3D games, were kind of designed with not like cinematic intention, but with kind of gameplay intention. That was another difference, I guess. Okay, I think we have to slowly wrap up, but maybe as a final question also in sort of um, preempting our um, experience soon to come with Idol in the, in the Große Haus. Um, there's lots of jungle in the film. And it's also commercialized as everything in that world. But maybe you can give a little insight or a little note on um, what is what constitutes this jungle and what's the cultural reference there. Because you also have like lots of reappearance of cultural history in Southeast Asia and the Sinoi come yeah. uh, come in as a as a term. So maybe that you expand a little bit um, um, on these two aspects. 
Sorry. about the jungle. Yeah. So I mean, okay, so the jungle, and I kind of grew up with this, right? The jungle in my like 12 year old cultural imaginary was like Vietnam War films, right? Can I think of an alternative? No, it's basically Vietnam War films. Um, in my, when I was interested in cinema, then I was like, oh, then the jungle is like Fitzcarraldo and like Agria. Deeply problematic when you think about it. Um, and, and also in video games, right? It's like Call of Duty franchises, you're fighting in the jungle as well. So I mean, I, I mean my family being from Malaysia, I kind of wanted to reposition the jungle because you know, jungle operates on a cinematic level as a like psychological mood of uncertainty, danger, and maybe like some kind of sublime confrontation with nature, I guess to say, or like with the lost. human condition. Exactly, it's about getting lost. Um, so I kind of, I mean, th because these were the dominant uh, impressions of, I guess, cinematic culture relating to the jungle, um, I kind of wanted to frame it as this, I mean, technological device, essentially. The setting of Idol, which is actually a real place called the Gunting Highlands Resort and Theme Park in Malaysia, was actually created at the border between two states, I think in about the late 1970s, early 1980s. It was kind of like this like Fitzcarraldo-like project, because there's essentially nothing there. And then a kind of um, Malaysian businessman kind of got license to create this like fantasy land I guess uh, about an hour away from Kuala Lumpur, which is the capital of Malaysia. So again, I mean, to me, it would it, it just seemed like a great setting to like appropriate this theme park uh, with this with this idea. And I think the other thing I would say is in you know in Idol, a lot the set design is like essentially Oriental in nature, very specifically Oriental, and it kind of made me think that. You know, just to again to be like self-critical about things, like are not like overseas Chinese communities the biggest Orientalists of all? And this is said with a lot of migrant communities because you know to preserve your culture, you need to highlight the the festivals, the aesthetics, the food that make it unique. Exactly. So this was you know just another angle on you know what is this you know is future novelty actually just you know repackaging the past, you know, whether that's like, you know, through um, skeuomorphic design or through kind of, um, you know, like cultural symbols from the past. And that I, I kind of wanted to use the architecture and the jungle to like ground the future in the present, really. Yeah. All right, Lawrence, thank thanks you so much for sharing with us. Yeah. Here. Extraordinary complex practice.